So continuing uh, from blood, we're going to talk about uh, blood vessels today. So what are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk kind of the general characteristics of blood vessels. So kind of what are the layers of the walls of the blood vessels um, and then the different types of blood vessels in the body. So we've talked a bit about arteries and veins in lab, but there are some other blood vessels in the body as well. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time on the fetal circulation since it is quite unique, especially about what's happening in the heart uh, and the lungs. And then we'll talk a little bit about some disorders. So what are the major types of blood vessels? So we have three major types, right? So we've talked a bit about arteries and veins, but maybe capillaries are a little bit new. So anything with an A, arteries or arterioles, anything that's going away from the heart. So arteries are just carrying blood away from the heart. And arterioles, arterioles are just small arteries. So it's kind of in the name, right? It, arterioles are just little arteries. So they're also running away. So essentially arteries are gonna turn into arterioles and then arterioles are gonna turn into capillaries. And capillaries are neither defined as an artery or a vein. They are a vessel and they're the smallest vessel in the body, okay? And then once the blood goes through the capillaries, then it's going to turn into a venule. So a venule is just a small vein, okay? And then those small venules are gonna get larger and kind of converge and merge together into veins. And so veins are then going to just return that blood to the heart. So if we look at the layers of a blood vessel, kind of the wall is layered, um, because we think about blood vessels very similarly to any other organ. So we have kind of an inner, middle, and outer layer, and we call them tunics. And we've seen the word tunic before. Um, we've seen them in the eyeball. So we have tunics in the blood vessels as well. So same thing as a layer, they just call it tunic. So our inner layer or the tunica intima is gonna be that innermost layer of the blood, of the blood vessel, okay? Now the tunica intima is essentially just a simple squamous epithelium. And they call that simple squamous epithelium an endothelium. Okay, so they also have, if the vessel is a little bit larger, so anything over one millimeter, uh, then it's going to have a subendothelial layer. So tunica intima might have two layers, but if you think of it just like the endothelium, then you, you have just one layer on the inside. Okay, but the bigger vessels do have an extra layer under that. Then you have a middle layer called the tunica media. So the tunica media is just a few layers of smooth muscle, okay? So remember we're talking about vessels and you may think that vessels don't have any muscle in there, but they do. They do have um, some layers of smooth muscle because in certain vessels, we are able to dilate them and constrict them. So remember we were talking about different areas of the body that we can you know, increase blood flow or decrease blood flow to, especially for thermoregulation. Well, vasoconstriction and vasodilation is how we do that, is we use these smooth muscles to constrict or dilate the vessels. So that's the tunica media. Again, think M for muscle, right? So that's our middle layer. And then our outermost layer is the tunica externa. So think external, right? So the outermost layer. And this is really just our connective tissue layer, okay? So for these larger vessels, essentially there's the wall is so thick 
that they need their own blood supply. So if it is a large vessel, they may have a structure called a vasovasorum. And essentially the vasovasorum is its own group of small vessels in that outermost layer, just to help bring the blood supply to that wall of the blood vessel, because it's just so thick that it needs a little extra blood supply. And of course, running through the middle of the blood vessel is an open tube. And so any sort of open tube we call a lumen. And that is where the blood is flowing through the vessel. So let's take a look at, and the, the layers for the walls of the blood vessels are the same uh, for the artery and for the vein. It's a little bit different in a capillary. Essentially, the capillary only has those endothelial cell layer um, and a basement membrane. And we'll talk a little bit more about the capillaries in a minute. But if you notice, um, here are our different layers and we have an artery on the left and a vein on the right. So very similar in our layers though. So tunica intima is the innermost layer and that's that endothelium, maybe plus or minus that subendothelial layer. It does have an elastic membrane in there, but don't worry too much about that. And then we have the tunica media. So that's going to be our muscle layer, maybe some elastic fibers in there. But again, don't worry too much about that. We'll talk a little bit about the ones that I want you to know that have the elastic fibers. Um, again, another elastic membrane in there, because again, we have blood pressure coming in and out of these vessels, especially in the arteries. And so you have to allow for some expansion and some recoil uh, with those elastic fibers and elastic membranes. And then we have that external, the tunica externa layer, and essentially it's showing the vasovasorum in here. So those little blood vessels that are essentially in the outermost layer just helping out with the blood supply in those larger blood vessels. So we've been talking about arteries as one big group and we know about now arterioles, which are our smallest arteries, but we can group these arteries into a couple different types of arteries. So our largest, our biggest arteries are called elastic arteries. So this is really the aorta. So the aorta is our largest artery in the body. And it has those major branches coming off that aortic arch. And these guys are all considered elastic arteries. And why they're elastic is because they have a high elastic fiber content. So essentially, if you think about, you know, all the force and pressure coming right out of the heart into the aorta from that left ventricle, all that this is the highest amount of blood pressure right in that aorta. So essentially these elastic fibers are gonna help uh, recoil and dampen that pressure that's coming out of the heart. Now the majority of our arteries are muscular arteries. So they're all gonna be distal to those large elastic arteries. And we named a lot of these arteries in lab. So the muscular arteries are really the ones that have names. They're quite large. Um, they have a large, a thick tunica media, which is that muscular layer, which is why they're called muscular arteries. They do have an elastic membrane or lamina, but again, don't worry too much about that. And then our arterioles are those smallest arteries that are going to eventually turn into capillaries. And our arterioles, another thing to note about the arterioles is that this is where that vasoconstriction and vasodilation is happening. So essentially we're able to control that internal diameter of the arterial uh, due to the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system can act on the blood vessels. So we can say we need more blood flow to our skeletal muscle, 
if we're trying to run away, right? Or more blood, you know, and then less blood flow to the digestive organs or vice versa. So this is where all that control of blood supply is happening in the arterioles. So these are just some microscopic views of those arteries. So on the upper left, we have an elastic artery, so very large. This is the aorta. And so if you notice, in this region here, we have a lot of elastic fibers, and those are the dark, dark fibers in there. And those guys are what are allowing that recoil and dampening that blood pressure. And then it also shows that vasovasorum. So here in that tunica externa, that outermost layer, we see some of these blood vessels in here that are going to bring in some extra blood supply to that thick wall of those large arteries. And then the majority of them are muscular arteries. So we have this huge tunica media, this huge muscular layer, it does have these elastic membranes on either side as well. So a little bit different instead of a bunch of elastic tissue within uh, the tunica media itself, it does have these elastic membranes. And then the bottom picture is a small arterial. It's the one on the right. Okay. So essentially it just has an endothelium and a tunica media. Um, so it's not very large at all. So now let's talk about capillaries. I love capillaries. They're the smallest blood vessels in the body. And they're very important because they are what are in all of our tissues. So we have all these capillary beds in amongst all of our tissue. And they're so small, they're only large enough for a single file of blood cells to pass through. And that's what this picture is. So here's our capillary right here. And essentially you just see those little blood cells running through the capillary single file. So very, very tiny blood vessel. And this is important because this is where all the action happens in the tissues. This is where all you all the nutrient and gas exchange is happening. So essentially we have diffusion of gases and nutrients in and out of that capillary and into the tissues. So it just depends on where the capillary is in the body. So if it's in the lungs, then you're going to have oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, right? If you're in the small intestines, well, then you're going to pick up all that nutrients from the inside of the small intestine, okay? If you're in some endocrine glands, you're going to pick up hormones. And if you're in the kidneys, then you're probably going to dump out some waste. Okay, so it just depends on where these capillaries are in the body for the different functions and what kind of nutrient and gas exchange is happening. So now we have a couple different types of capillaries. So not only are capillaries throughout all the tissues of the body, they have different functions in those different tissues, just depending on what the, what the function of that tissue is. So now we have a couple different types of capillaries to um, allow for those different functions. And what happens is, is we talk about the leakiness of the capillary. So how easy is it for fluid and possibly other uh, products to leak out of the capillary? So our first type of capillary is our most common type of capillary. So this is in most of our organs and most of our tissues. And essentially, when we talked about our endo, our epithelial cells, we had these different cell junctions. So that's what they're talking about, this endothelium with those with those different types of cell junctions. So you have tight junctions and you have desmosomes. So those are normal epithelial cell junctions. But what happens is, is you have these intercellular clefts and essentially they are gaps in the, in the cells. 
okay? So between the cells, you're gonna have these intercellular clefts. So essentially we said endothelial cells or epithelial cells are normally very tightly packed together, right? That's why they have these cell junctions. But in an endothelium in these capillaries, we have some spaces and it allows for small molecules to go in and out of the capillary. So these are normal continuous capillaries in the body. So these are the most common type, okay? So our second type of capillary is a fenestrated capillary. So these guys are in areas that we have a high exchange rate, meaning that there's a lot of diffusion going on, okay? So these guys have tight junctions and desmosomes and those intracellular clefts, just like our continuous capillaries, but we also have pores. So not only do we have the clefts, we also have pores in those endothelial cells. And the pores are called fenestrations, hence fenestrated capillaries, okay? So these places um, of a high exchange rate might be the intestines, the kidneys, endocrine glands. So you know that these guys are going to have a lot of exchange, a lot of nutrients, a lot of filtration, absorption, a lot of action happening. So these guys are only going to be in those specific high exchange areas. Okay, so not as common as our continuous capillaries. Our third type of capillary is called a sinusoid capillary. Now we've heard the word sinusoid before when we were talking about the bone marrow. So sinusoids live in the bone marrow. Now these capillaries are very leaky. So if you notice the picture, there's lots of holes. So they are very wide leaky capillaries. So definitely found in the bone marrow, but also in the spleen. And essentially they have the same types of holes. They have the intercellular clefts and they have the fenestrations, but essentially they're just very large holes. So they're just a lot larger uh, than in the other two types of capillaries. So in the bone marrow, we have to be able to get those, you know, mature, newly made cells into the bloodstream. So they have to be large enough holes to allow for larger molecules to get into uh, the capillaries, okay? So this is just the picture showing the three different types of capillaries and the leakiness. So continuous capillary is the least leaky or least permeable. So when we talk about leakiness, we're talking about permeability and they're the most common. So we find them in the skin, muscle, all over the body. Now fenestrated capillary is a little more permeable, a little more leaky, and we find that in the kidney and the small intestine. And then we have our sinusoid capillary, which is our most leaky or most permeable. And this is gonna be in our bone marrow, spleen, also liver. So a lot of big molecules and cells can pass through uh, these large holes in these capillaries. So this is just putting down that permeability into writing. So the ease of things moving in and out of the capillary is the permeability or the leakiness. And so we can kind of classify the three um, different types of capillaries by their permeability. So sinusoids being the most leaky or most permeable to continuous, which is the least permeable or least leaky and fenestrated is kind of in the middle. So I want you to know this um, difference, okay? Now there are different ways for molecules and things to get in and out of capillaries. So direct diffusion, right? They can just diffuse out of the cell and that's most of our gases or uh, liquid. 
but if it's a larger molecule, it has to go through a hole. So that's where the intracellular clefts come into play and the fenestration. So they have to physically be able to get out through a hole. And then you also have cytoplasmic vesicles. So if it's something that can't go through the hole, it might have to be put into a vesicle and then it can get out through the cell from the vesicle. So we talked about our three different types of capillaries in the body. Well, we have very specific types of capillaries in the brain and they have the least permeability of all of our different types of capillaries. So essentially you can say our body has four different types of capillaries and the blood brain barrier is our fourth type. So these guys, these capillaries have complete tight junctions, no intercellular clefts, meaning they have no holes whatsoever. It's a complete tight junction nothing can pass um, in between those cells and there's no holes okay so only very important molecules can pass through here they have a very selective transport mechanism to be able to say what can go in and out essentially the brain is like a gated community so there are certain things that can get by and some things we want and some things we don't want. So oxygen and carbon dioxide gases are generally okay. Like they can get through. And that's how some of our anesthetic and drugs work as well as they do cross the blood brain barrier. They can get out of those capillaries and affect the cells in the brain. So we said these capillaries are in all of our tissues, right? And so we call these network of capillaries capillary beds. So they're running throughout all of our tissues. And depending on the tissue type, we have those different types of capillaries for the different functions of the tissues. So what is important about these capillary beds? is essentially we said this is where all the nutrient and gas exchange is happening. So essentially, we have to decrease our blood pressure by the time the blood hits the capillary bed. Because we said those red blood cells have to go through the capillaries in a single file line, right? So we don't want a lot of blood pressure pushing those uh, blood cells through the capillaries. We also want to allow for that gas exchange and nutrient exchange to happen. So essentially we have to decrease our blood pressure um, in those arterioles before we hit the capillary bed, okay? So in our picture here, we're showing a capillary, a normal capillary bed on the top. So we have our arteriole coming in, that nicely oxygenated blood, and it's gonna pass through, this whole thing is the capillary bed. Okay, so a network of these tiny little vessels, tiny little capillaries. And this is where all that nutrient and gas exchange is happening. So but by the time those cells hit that area and are passing through single file, it's allowing for that nutrient and gas exchange. And then it's going to exit through those venules and back to the heart via those veins. Okay. Now we can regulate the blood flow through the capillary bed. So say it's a tissue that we may not need as much blood flow through. So these sphincters, these pre-capillary sphincters are able to um, shut off the blood flow to that tissue if needed. So that's our second picture is essentially cutting off that blood supply to the capillary bed, just in case we need that blood flow somewhere else we can regulate the blood flow, okay? So once the blood has passed through that capillary bed, all that gas exchange, nutrient exchange has happened, now all that blood is going to return to the heart uh, via the venous system. So any sort of uh, vessel that is returning towards the heart is going to be considered in the venous system.
So because we had to drop that blood pressure to allow all those uh, red blood cells to go through all those little capillaries single file, our blood pressure has pretty much uh, disappeared, right? So now the blood pressure is a lot lower in the veins than in the arteries. So it's a much lower pressure system. Okay, so the arterial system is high pressure. Then we have to drop that pressure to go through the capillary bed to allow for the gas and nutrient exchange. And then we pretty much just have very little blood pressure left uh, going through the venous system. So once we pass through that um, capillary bed, we are gonna be in um, the venules, which are going to be the smallest veins. Okay, so venules first, so post-capillary venule, and then the venules are going to join together to form the veins. And the veins are what we have named, um, they actually have names in the body. So what is the structure of a vein? So we talked about kind of the walls of all vessels, right? So we have an endothelium on the inside, we have a muscular layer, um, and then we have an outer kind of uh, wall layer. Sometimes the bigger uh, vessels have to have their own um, blood supply in that outer wall. But what are some differences when we compare arteries and veins, okay? So if we look at a vein, so here's our picture over here. We have an artery on the left and we have a vein on the right. So this is a histologic picture, a, a cross section through uh, these two vessels. So if you notice the artery, the lumen, which is the inside here, is much smaller than the lumen of the vein. So this lumen of the vein is much larger. So the diameter essentially of the vessel, uh, the lumen vessel is quite a bit larger in a vein. Um, when we talk about the tunica externa, so that's that outer layer we talked about, um, is quite a bit thicker in the vein, even though it doesn't maybe look like it here. But if you look at this whole layer here is that uh, tunica externa, okay? And there's less elastin because we don't need those elastic fibers because um, we don't have that high blood pressure, right? So in the walls of the arteries, we have quite a bit of elastin to allow for the stretch and recoil as well. And just overall though, even though we said that tunica externa is thicker, the overall wall um, is thinner comparable to arteries because we again, don't have to deal with that high blood pressure. So the overall, the take home message is there's a lower pressure system in the venous uh, return. So the blood returning back to the heart uh, is just a much lower pressure um, when we talk about the blood flow through the veins versus the arteries. So how do we actually get the blood back to the heart then? So if we have a high pressure system going away from the heart and the arterial system to get out to the uh, tissues, how do we get that blood back to the heart, right? Because we no longer have the blood pressure to get the flow of blood back to the heart. So there are some tricks that we actually have to help these, uh, these veins get the blood back to the heart. So unlike arteries, there are some valves in some of these larger veins. So the valves are gonna work just like they work uh, in the heart. So it's gonna prevent the backflow of blood um, through the vessel. So if we look at our picture here and we have our blood flow going this way, right? We have these valves open to allow the blood flow to go, but then they are gonna close once the blood passes that valve and it's gonna uh, prevent that backflow of blood uh, through that vessel. Um, these, this is very common in limbs because imagine limbs are so far away from the heart, they really have to, um, they have a long way to go, right? So this is really gonna help um, with the, with the venous return from the limbs.
Um, they're not going to be in any of the body cavities. So you really only find them in the limbs, uh, not in the thoracic or abdominal veins in the the veins in the thoracic and abdominal cavities, I should say. But there's another thing that helps us too, is we do have this skeletal muscle pump. So essentially, just like the picture shows, you know, these muscles are going to be pressing up against the vessels. So when we uh, use those muscles, when we contract the muscles, they're going to help squeeze the blood through the vessel in just any natural movements. And this is really, again, important in the limbs, right? So especially our legs, which are the furthest away from the heart. So walking is a very uh, natural uh, pump to help push the blood through those veins back to the heart. And then the vessels, the valves in the vessels are gonna help prevent that backflow uh, once we push the blood through with the muscles. Okay, so these are just ways that we are able to help the blood flow get back to the heart since we have such a low uh, pressure system. So we've already covered a bit of the pulmonary circulation when, when we were talking about the heart, uh, but we're just gonna talk about it again because it is different from our systemic circuit that we've been talking about. So the systemic circuit is going from the left side of the heart out to the tissues and coming back to the right side. So the pulmonary circuit is gonna start in that right side uh, from that right atria and right ventricle out through that pulmonary trunk through those pulmonary arteries and out to the lungs. So again, even though we're arteries, we're the pulmonary arteries, we're going to be carrying that deoxygenated blood. So we got to go out to the lungs, get reoxygenated, and then head back to the heart via those pulmonary veins. So those pulmonary veins are going to be carrying that oxygenated blood nice and fresh from the lungs, and then we can go out to the system. So what we just have to remember overall is that the pulmonary circuit is just a lot lower pressure than the systemic circuit. We're not going very far out to the lungs, so the vessels just overall don't have to deal <clears throat> with the types of pressure that we see in the systemic circuit. So the vessel walls are gonna be a lot thinner in general. Um, we have a max arterial pressure that is a lot lower um, in the pulmonary circuit than we do see in the systemic circuit, okay? So now we're gonna start talking about all those different uh, vessels in the systemic circulation. So just as a review, the systemic arteries are gonna be carrying all that oxygenated blood uh, away from the heart and out to the tissues, the aorta being our first and largest artery in the body. And it has the highest resistance in the body, right? So we're going out to the tissues. So that systemic circuit has high resistance. So that left side of the heart has to pump a lot harder, a lot stronger to get the blood out to the tissues. And then the systemic veins are just gonna be carrying all that deoxygenated blood back to the heart from all those tissues. So just a review on the aorta, because we've talked about this a little bit, um, especially the vessels just coming straight out of the heart, the aorta, we've got some branches uh, that are going to come right off that aortic arch. So we talked a lot about the coronary arteries uh, coming straight back to the heart in the heart lecture. So those are really our very first branches. So we can't forget about those coronary arteries um, that are going to come right off the base of that aorta. So we've already been talking about those uh, already. So what are the next branches? So we have the ascending aorta coming up, and then we're gonna go through that aortic arch before we go down the descending aorta into the thoracic aorta. So you see there's three vessels here that are gonna branch off that aortic arch. And it's not symmetrical going to the right side of the body to the left side of the body. So to the right side, our very first branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. 
So the brachiocephalic trunk is going to go to the right side of the body. And so it then has two main branches, the right common carotid and the right subclavian. Okay, so these guys are going to go to the neck and head, if you're the common carotid, and the subclavian down the arm. Okay, so then that's different from the left side. We don't see a brachiocephalic trunk on the left side. The next two branches are going to be our left common carotid and left subclavian. So again, the right side is different from the left side. And this is species dependent. So not all species are the same of how we um, branch these first few arteries off the aorta. So now if we continue following the aorta, uh, we go through the thoracic aorta if we're in the thoracic cavity, and then the abdominal aorta through the abdomen. And once you get through the abdomen and all those branches to those, um, all those viscera, all those organs in there, then it's going to have two main branches going down each leg. So those guys are going to be the common iliac uh, arteries, the left and right, okay? And they're going to continue down to the lower limbs. So let's go back up to the head and neck and follow some of these uh, branches off the aorta that are going to uh, feed up to the head and neck. So we have these pairs of arteries that are going to be heading up the neck, supplying the brain and the face and all those muscles of the head and neck. So first we have those carotid arteries, right? So we have our right common carotid and left common carotid. Now the right common carotid is different because it branches off that brachiocephalic trunk. But both of these guys are going to then branch into the external and internal carotid arteries, which is why we call that first branch the common carotid. So the common carotid is then going to branch into the external and internal carotid arteries. So we'll talk about those guys in just a minute. Okay. But let's look then at the subclavian arteries. So we said the subclavian arteries are going to eventually go to the upper limbs. But first it's going to send off a branch up to the head, okay? So the right, again, the right subclavian is different because it branches off that brachiocephalic trunk, but the left subclavian just comes right off the aorta. So these guys are going to send off this vertebral artery. Okay, so the vertebral artery is going to be important in just a minute because it's going to help supply uh, the brain. Okay, so we'll talk about the vertebral artery in just a minute, but we have to remember that the vertebral artery branches off that subclavian artery. Okay, so here's, I've circled the vertebral artery here. So if we follow our arrow down and we look, here's that vertebral artery and guess where that runs? So it branches off that subclavian and it runs through those cervical foramina. Remember we saw those weird, those cervical vertebrae have those weird foramina in the transverse uh, process. So those transverse uh, foramina um, are very different than any of the other vertebrae. So that is the point is this, this artery, this vertebral artery is going to run in those transverse foramina up to the brain. Okay, so that's why this is a little bit different. But it, we already learned those foramina and now there's a purpose for them. Okay. So now if we look a little closer at that common carotid and those two branches, we said that we had an external and internal carotid artery. So for external, think outside head, okay? So the face and the base of the skull. Again, you don't need to know these individual arteries that are going to branch off that um, external carotid. Just know that what where these uh, branches are going to feed. Okay, so they're going to feed the face and the base of the skull. Okay, so external, think outside. So face is outside the brain, right? 
versus the internal carotid is going to go inside the head and give rise to branches that are going to feed the brain and the eyes. Okay, so again, internal is going to go inside into the brain and the eyes. And again, you don't need to know these individual arteries, but if you look, ophthalmic artery, that makes sense, going to the eyeball. And then the cerebral artery is going to the brain. Okay, so external face and base of skull, internal to the brain and the eyes. So now if we look at the arteries of the brain, this is going to be where that vertebral artery is going to come into play. So if we're looking, we're looking at the base of the brain. So the, the underside of the brain where all those cranial nerves are going to come off the brain stem. So if we look at the anterior part of the brain, this is the part that's going to be supplied by that internal carotid artery. Okay, so that internal carotid artery is going to come in. So if you see it, you can follow the line right here. So on either side, we've got a, an internal carotid artery, and it's going to give rise to these, this anterior communicating artery that's going to be part of this circle that kind of circles around um, the pituitary gland, actually. So the pituitary gland kind of sits right in the middle of this circle. So it's going to create part of that uh, cerebral arterial circle, okay? And then the posterior brain, so that, that whole part is going to feed that anterior brain, so the frontal lobe, all that good stuff. And then the posterior side is going to be supplied by the vertebral artery. So remember we said that vertebral artery is going to be coming up uh, those um, transverse foramina and the cervical vertebrae, but that branches off of that subclavian artery. And what happens is these vertebral arteries are going to merge into one basilar artery. Okay? So it branches or it converges into that basilar artery, and that basilar artery is going to feed that posterior part of that cerebral arterial circle. Okay. So obviously there's a lot of branches coming off of this cerebral arterial circle, but you don't need to know all of that. I just want you to know the two arteries that are supplying the brain. So that internal carotid artery and those vertebral arteries that are going to turn into the basilar artery. Okay, so these guys are the ones supplying the brain. So now if we go back to our aorta, that descending aorta that's going to turn into the thoracic aorta, we can see the blood supply to the thorax. So the posterior part of the thorax, or toward the spine, right, we're going to have these posterior intercostal arteries. So essentially they're just going to be branches uh, right at the level of the ribs. Okay, so intercostal, right, in between the ribs. So there's just going to be a couple of branches that are going to come off and run in between the ribs. Okay, you don't need to know how many of them or anything like that. Okay. Now the anterior thorax is going to be a little bit different. So there are these internal thoracic arteries. Okay, so internal thoracic arteries that are going to kind of branch off of the subclavian, so all the way up from the subclavian, and come down the front side of the rib cage. Okay, so they're going to uh, branch off the subclavian and run down that anterior side of the thorax. Okay. And then from that internal thoracic artery down the anterior side, they are going to give off a couple of branches and they give off the anterior intercostals. So again, we have posterior intercostals and anterior intercostals, but where they come off are a little bit different. So they run in the same place, they run in the intercostal space, but the posterior ones come off the thoracic aorta and the anterior ones come off that internal thoracic arteries, okay? It's a little bit different, but 
just know we've got some intercostal arteries that are going to be supplying all those intercostal muscles, um, all those muscles of the thorax, okay? So if we follow those subclavian arteries, the subclavian arteries are either coming straight off the aorta or from that brachiocephalic trunk, okay? So once they pass the um, armpit or essentially enter the armpit area, they're gonna become the axillary artery, okay? And then the axillary artery is going to become the brachial artery. So again, this is the same artery, okay? So it's just the same artery that's continuing down the arm, but when it enters a region of the arm, it's going to change name. So again, it's the same artery. It may branch later on, but essentially we're just changing the name of the artery. So we follow that subclavian. Let me pick another color here. So if we follow that subclavian artery, once it hits the axillary region under the armpit and the shoulder, it's gonna become the axillary artery. Once it hits the humerus and that arm region, okay, it's gonna become the brachial artery. And then the brachial artery is then going to branch into the radial artery and the ulnar artery, okay? So now if we follow that abdominal aorta, we've got a bunch of arteries going out to all the organs, which that makes sense, right? We're gonna have to feed all of the organs. So the first branch up here is gonna be the inferior phrenic artery, okay? So the inferior phrenic artery is gonna come up to the diaphragm. And then we're gonna have a celiac trunk. So the celiac trunk, again, anything with trunk is gonna be just kind of like a base, and there's gonna be lots of, lots of branches off the trunk. So the celiac trunk is going to essentially give off branches to the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, even part of the small intestine. So lots of branches off that celiac trunk to the superior abdomen. And then we're going to have um, arteries that go straight to the uh, kidneys and to the adrenal glands. So we have the renal artery to the kidneys and then the suprarenal arteries uh, to the adrenal glands. And then the gonadal arteries are gonna go down to either the, tes the uh, testicles or the ovaries. So they'll either become the testicular artery or the ovarian artery, okay? And then again, the termination of that abdominal aorta is when it splits and branches to those common iliac arteries down to the lower limbs. So we said the celiac trunk supplies a lot of the um, organs in the superior abdomen including the stomach, um, we have actually two special branches though, just to the intestines. So that's the small intestine and the large intestine. So we have a superior mesenteric artery, which is gonna supply uh, those superior intestines, okay? And then we have the inferior mesenteric artery that's gonna be supplying the inferior intestines down in that region, okay? So you don't need to know the branches off these mesenteric arteries, just know that they're going to the intestines and it's very important we get blood supply to the intestines, okay? So now we're gonna continue from the abdomen down the lower limbs. So we have those common iliac arteries that are gonna continue down the lower limb. And our first branch is gonna be the internal iliac artery. And that's gonna go out to some of our pelvic organs, okay? But the main one that's gonna continue down the limb is the external iliac. And that's gonna turn into the femoral artery. So again, it's the same artery, just continuing down the leg and 
when we hit a different region, we're going to call it a different name. So the femoral artery is going to uh, change from the external iliac once we hit that hip region. Okay, so now it's going to be the femoral artery and that's going to continue down the femur until it hits the back of the knee. And then it's going to be the popliteal artery. Okay. So if we switch our pictures here, it's going to kind of go down the posterior side of the leg. So the popliteal artery is then going to branch. It's going to branch to the anterior tibial and posterior tibial. Okay. So we've just been talking about some of the arteries of our system. So now we're going to go and talk about the veins. So again, our venous system is returning blood back to the heart. And there's three major veins that enter that right atrium. So we have the superior and inferior vena cavas and that coronary sinus returning that heart blood back to the heart. Now the thing about the venous system is that we have some deep and some superficial veins. So arteries in general tend to just be deep and there's going to be a deep vein running with that artery. But the superficial veins are just going to lie underneath the skin. So they are not associated with any arteries and they have their and they have different names. So the names of the deep veins are going to follow those arteries and be named the same. But the superficial veins are going to not be associated with any artery and are just going to lie just beneath the uh, skin. So we do have a couple of interesting patterns of venous blood. So we call them sinuses. Um, so we've talked about the dural sinuses in the brain, um, the coronary sinus in the heart, uh, and then also the hepatic portal system. So the hepatic portal system is a very specific um, venous return, venous drainage uh, of the intestinal uh, blood. So the intestinal blood is going to have to go through the liver first before it returns to the heart. And we'll talk more about that hepatic portal system in a few minutes. So if we look at the superior vena cava, it's going to return any blood that's going to be superior to the diaphragm. So that's going to be the thoracic cavity, the upper limbs, the head and neck. Okay. And then the inferior vena cava is going to return anything uh, below the diaphragm. Okay, so abdominal cavity, lower limbs. Okay. And essentially both of the vena cavas are going to um, join at the right atrium, right? So the right atrium is going to return all the receive all the returning blood from the body. So let's look at some of the veins of the head and neck first. Okay, so we've talked about the dural sinuses already, and they're really draining all of the blood from the brain. Okay, so any sort of sinus we just kind of think of as like a pooling vessel. Okay, so it's just going to be a vessel um, that's a little bit larger. It's just going to drain um, a lot of different vessels, and it's just going to be a little larger. Okay. So we have a couple different dural sinuses and I don't uh, require you to know the different ones. These are just two of the bigger ones. So the cavernous sinus is going to sit kind of right at, um, kind of right near the pituitary gland, okay? And then we have our superior sagittal sinus that we already talked about kind of up uh, in between the dura matter uh, layers, okay? So we've talked about those, uh, the superior sagittal, and then the cavernous sinus is kind of new as well. But these guys are going to drain into the jugular veins. So more specifically, that internal uh, jugular vein. Okay, so we're looking at the right side of the head. So we're the right internal jugular. So essentially the internal jugular is going to drain blood from the brain and the face. So we can't forget about the face. 
and essentially it lies close to um, the internal and common carotid arteries. So it's going to run uh, with those carotid arteries down the side of the neck. Okay. The external jugular is a lot smaller and less important, I'd say. Uh, the internal jugular is really the larger vessel and is uh, more significant. But the external jugular does exist, and it just essentially um, drains kind of the scalp area, so the more external regions of the head and it's going to empty into the subclavian vein. So it's going to be a little bit different. So here's our external jugular vein. So if we follow it down, it's actually going to drain into the subclavian, whereas our internal uh, jugular, which is the larger one, is going to come in um, more towards the junction of the subclavian uh, and the brachiocephalic, okay? So if we look at the veins of the thorax, so we know we have our intercostal arteries, so we're going to have some intercostal veins as well. Okay, and those uh, intercostal veins okay, are going to drain into what is called the azygose vein. So the azygose vein is a little bit different, um, but it's the one that's going to drain into that superior vena cava. Okay. Don't worry about the connection, these hemiazygous veins. Just know that those intercostal veins will eventually run into the azygous vein. Okay. Now, if we look at the upper limb veins, now again, when we're talking about limbs, we're talking about deep and superficial veins. So the deep veins are pretty easy. They're just going to follow the deep artery. Okay, so they're going to have the same name as that artery and run in the same location. So we have a radial, ulnar, brachial, and axillary vein. So it's the same as the arteries. Okay, they're just going to be running together. Now our superficial veins are going to be a little bit different. Okay, so they're going to run beneath the skin. These are the vessels you can actually see, you know, especially people that have prominent vessels. You can see them underneath the skin, and these are the veins. So if we follow these guys, we've got uh, two superficial ones on the forearm. That's going to be the cephalic vein kind of laterally and the basilic vein more medially. Okay. And we do have a median cubital vein that connects the two right over the elbow, the anterior side of the elbow, okay? And we do have a median vein in the forearm area that kind of comes up and joins the basilic vein. Don't worry as much about that one, okay? But these, uh, the cephalic and the basilic could continue all the way up and join up into the subclavian vein. Okay, so if we follow these guys all the way up, they're going to run into that subclavian vein and then back to the superior vena cava. Okay, and that median cubital is going to connect the two right over the um, right over the uh, elbow. And this is just a common location for um, intravenous uh, fluid therapy, uh, blood draws. So just kind of a a good vein to know about, okay? So this just shows you on, you know, a surface view of the vessels as well as the cadaver view. So this median cubital vein is just a good one uh, for, uh, like I said, blood draws has some medical purposes, okay? So I just wrote this out for you. Now, the veins of the abdomen are pretty much going to follow the arteries, okay? So these guys are going to all dump into the inferior vena cava. So the hepatic veins from the liver, the renal veins from the kidneys, those suprarenal veins from the adrenal glands, and then those gonadal veins from the testicles and ovaries. So they're all going to drain into that inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava is the large uh, 
structure following that abdominal aorta. So the abdominal aorta would sit right next to it. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more about that hepatic portal system. So essentially it's a very specialized vascular circuit. Okay. So it means that we're going to drain blood from the intestines and send it to the liver first. Okay. Before we send it back to the heart. So our hepatic portal vein is our main player here. And that's going to be draining all of the blood from the organs, the digestive organs specifically. So the di so anything from the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines, they're going to deliver it to the uh, liver first for processing before we go back to the heart. Okay. So. We have two different capillary beds, which is what's kind of important about this portal system, is that we have to process the nutrients and the toxins first before we can send all that blood back to the heart. Okay. So which veins are going to drain into the hepatic portal vein? So anything that's going to drain the intestines. So the superior mesenteric vein, the gastric vein, and the inferior mesenteric vein, those guys are all associated with intestines and the stomach. And the weird one is the splenic vein. So the splenic vein also drains into the hepatic portal system because our spleen is responsible for fighting uh, or finding and getting pathogens out of the blood. So we want to send those pathogens for to the liver first for destruction. So we don't send those pathogens straight back to the heart. Okay, so that makes sense. So we have to send all the nutrients and the pathogens to the liver first. So for processing. Okay. So if we look at the top picture here, we have our intestinal, our stomach and intestinal capillary beds that are going to be picking up all the nutrients and possibly toxins if you're the, if you're the spleen as well. So the spleen is going to pick up the toxins and the stomach and intestines are picking up the nutrients. Then we're going to get transported through that hepatic portal vein to the liver. Okay, where all those liver cells, those hepatocytes, are going to process all those nutrients and toxins. Okay, and that way then it can do something with the toxins and the nutrients. And then we're going to send all that um, nutrient, uh, you know, we've gotten all the nutrients out, all the toxins out, and we're just going to send that deoxygenated blood back through the hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava and to the heart. Okay. So this just shows you a little bit um, of a schematic of the hepatic portal system. So we're going to drain the spleen, the stomach, um, any sort of intestines. Okay. Back through this hepatic portal vein. Okay. So it's going to drain all of those structures, all that blood, and it's going to send it to the liver. So the liver processes all those nutrients and toxins and sends that deoxygenated blood back to the heart, okay, through the regular hepatic veins. So the hepatic portal vein is different from the regular hepatic vein, okay? So let's finish up the veins with the lower limb, okay? So again, just like the upper limb, we're going to have deep veins and superficial veins. So the deep veins are going to share the same name and run in the same location as their artery friends, okay? So we have a femoral vein, anterior and posterior tibial vein, and the iliac veins, okay? So external, internal, and common iliac veins. So they're going to just run in the same location, named the same, and everything like that. 
And then we do have some su superficial veins as well. So these guys do not have an accompanying artery. They're superficial right under the skin. And the main one is the great saphenous. Okay, so the great saphenous is our main superficial vein that's gonna run up and converge with the femoral vein up in that region. But it's gonna drain all the skin of the leg, okay? And the small saphenous essentially is on the lateral aspect, okay? But it, the main one that I want you to know is the, the great saphenous. So now let's talk a little bit about fetal circulation. What is happening in that developing fetus in utero? So what is the difference? What is the fetus not using when it's living in an environment of fluid, right? So if you think about it, right, they are not gonna be using their lungs. So they're gonna want to try to shunt blood away from the lungs. They don't need oxygenation in the lungs. They can't use oxygenated in the oxygenation in the lungs. So they bypass it. So they're only gonna send enough blood out to the lungs to keep the cells alive and developing the lungs, but we're not doing any sort of oxygenation. So the fetus has to get oxygen from the placenta okay so the placenta essentially think of them as the fetal lungs okay so they're going to shunt blood away from the pulmonary circuit to the left side of the heart so essentially we call it um, a right to left shunt okay so it does this in two different ways. So first, it's gonna try to shunt blood from the right atrium to the left atrium via a hole called the foramen ovale. So the foramen ovale is a hole between the right and the left atrium. So it's gonna try to shunt blood over to the left, sa to the left side, okay? So just bypass the right ventricle and the lungs all together. And if that doesn't work, okay, so some of the blood is gonna go into the right ventricle and out that pulmonary trunk. Well, we're gonna try to catch it before it goes out to the lungs again and shunt blood through another opening. And this time it's a little uh, vessel essentially, and it's called the ductus arteriosus. And so that is gonna try to shunt blood from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta, okay? So it has two different shunts, okay, to try to shunt blood away from the lungs. So what does it do? So we have these umbilical vessels that are connecting the heart and the, the fetus to the placenta. So again, think of the placenta like the fetal lungs. Okay, and if you think of it that way, you'll remember this, okay? So we have some umbilical arteries. So again, arteries are going away from the heart. So they're carrying low oxygenated blood away from the heart and to the placenta, okay? Think they're very similar to the pulmonary arteries, right? So they go out to the placenta to get oxygenated via mom's blood and mom's oxygen. And then it's gonna come back through an unpaired umbilical vein. So the umbilical vein is gonna carry this nicely fresh oxygenated blood to the fetus, just like the pulmonary veins, okay? So again, if we think about the placenta like the lungs, then you can understand this fetal circulation better, okay? So the placenta is really important because we're gonna be oxygenating the developing fetus, but you're also gonna be bringing in nutrients, getting rid of wastes. So it's gonna act like, um, you know, like the lungs, but also a lot of other organs in the body as well while the fetus develops. So this just shows you that close-up picture of the, of, of the uh, fetal circulation and the different blood supply. Because again, if you're mixing the blood, right, you're shunting it away from the um, lungs, you're going to the placenta, you're gonna get this mixture of oxygenated blood, okay? And that's the purple, 
that's the purple looking uh, things is it's just kind of a you know we have some areas of moderate oxygenation low oxygenation compared to our just high and low uh, in the normal adult circulation okay So what happens when the fetus takes its first breath, or now it's a baby, right? So it's, it's born and it breathes its first breath. So that's how we stop this fetal circulation, okay? Because obviously we don't want holes and things in our heart normally, right? So the lungs inflate, right? You take your first breath that pulmonary resistance is actually going to decrease, meaning blood flow is going to want to go into the lungs, okay? So you're going to have a rush of blood from those pulmonary arteries and into the lungs, okay, to get oxygenated for the first time. But what also happens is then you're going to have blood coming back into the left atrium. So pressure is going to increase in the left atrium, and that's going to close that foramen ovale. So if we increase the pressure over here in the left atrium, that's going to put pressure and close that door, that foramen ovale. Okay, it's a little flap-like opening, so we're going to close the flap, close that door, and then the, essentially the ductus arteriosus is no longer being used, right? So all the blood's going to be now going to the lungs, and this will essentially just close and atrophy over time. So it's going to just become then a ligament, okay? So it's going to close, but then we have this fetal remnant structure called the ligamentum arteriosum. Okay, so these are our two uh, fetal remnant structures that we can actually appreciate in the adult heart. Okay, the fossa ovalis, that used to be the foramen ovale, and then the ligamentum arteriosum that used to be the ductus arteriosus. Okay, so this is just explaining that process that I just talked about when we take that first breath and how we transition from the placenta to the lungs as our main oxygenation. Okay, and this just shows you that too with the heart as what's happening. So we do see some disorders of blood vessels, so we'll go through these as well, okay? So atherosclerosis, we have um, looked at this a little bit when we were talking about the heart uh, because it does affect the heart as well if it happens in those coronary arteries, but it can uh, happen in other arteries of the body as well. Okay, so it's just this plaque buildup um, in the arteries of the body. And then an aneurysm, essentially you get a widening or a weakening of an artery or even a vein, but it can be more significant in an artery. And essentially that is an aneurysm. So it can happen in the abdominal aorta, in the brain, in the kidneys. Um, so an aneurysm is just this weakening or widening of a vessel. And then a thrombosis is essentially a clot formation in a blood vessel. Normally, we wouldn't want um, a throm, you know, a clot in the vessel, right? Unless we're just trying to stop bleeding in the periphery. But essentially, we don't want it to be large enough to actually prevent blood flow, because that can be um, quite significant. If the clot is large enough to prevent blood blood flow then you get this thrombosis, okay? Um, and if it happens in, this, in the pulmonary circuit, you can get pulmonary embolisms, okay? If that clot goes to the lungs, and then we can block that blood flow in the lungs, which can be uh, quite bad. And then varicose veins are just something that happens with age. And essentially, we talked about how difficult it is to return that venous blood back to the heart from the limbs, that just over time, uh, you can get pooling or backflow of blood in those vessels. And so essentially, you just get these bulging uh, vessels under the skin, right? These superficial vessels that um, are just uh, insufficient, okay? Okay. 
the valves become insufficient and therefore the veins um, start to pool, start to build, and you get varicose veins. So I kind of uh, did two part uh, learning objectives because I know this is a large uh, lecture. So I just did some characteristics of the blood vessels that we talked about kind of in the first part of the lecture. And then the second part of our learning objectives are actually the blood vessels of the body. So our arteries and our veins of the body and a little bit of the hepatic portal system and some of those, the, um, the fetal circulation and some of our um, disorders. So our next lecture will be on the lymphatic and immune system, and that will end our unit on the circulatory system, okay? And then I'll give you guys details about the upcoming uh, lecture exam as well, okay? Until then, stay safe. Miss you guys.